God, that we're on solid ground with you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Help us, Lord, to cast our cares upon you, Lord God, knowing that you care for us, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Just a couple of quick reminders. We took up our Channels of Blessings Hallelujah. offering on Mon Sunday. Excuse me. It's our National Women's Department offering. So if you did not Hallelujah. get a chance to turn that in, if you could um, get that to us ASAP. And um, the Alive Conference is this Saturday at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 10 o'clock in the morning um, at um, Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ if you're going. Typically they serve food, but... COVID, <laughs> so they won't be right, serving any right, food. Right. Praise the Lord. Someday we won't have to say that anymore. Amen. Amen. That's Let's right. Let's worship Praise him tonight. God. Amen. Standing here, not knowing. But holding on to faith you know best nothing can catch you by surprise you've got this figured out and you're watching us now but when it looks as if we can't win you wrap us in your arms and step in, and everything we need you supply, you've got this in control, and now we know that you made a way, when our backs were against the wall, and it looked as if it was over.
understand. Hallelujah. Yes, Hallelujah. Lord. The path that yes, he has Lord. us take. Yes, Hallelujah. Lord. But he has a way that he wants yes, us to travel. Lord. Hallelujah, yes, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah.
God. Thank you for the victory, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah, glory, Jesus. glory to your hallelujah, name. Thank Jesus. you, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. Across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I have owed. Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. Jesus, you have saved. 
trade our sorrow for your joy tonight, God. We trade our sickness and our pain, Lord, for the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Hallelujah. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. He's the everlasting God, the mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated here tonight. Thank you, musicians. Praise God. We want to remind you to hold up the Nickerson family in prayer, Tim Nickerson with the loss of his father and, and different situations. And not too long ago, 
his mother passed away, and so this is it's quite a bit when you lose a mother and a father that you're close to. You know, it's, it's sometimes you're not so close to your parents. It's still hard, but it's even harder sometimes when you're close to them. Amen. And so we want to remember them. Just hold them up in prayer. And if you can be at the memorial service at 1, 1 p.m. on Sunday, I think Sister Olek texted the information. If you didn't get that, please see her. Amen. And that would be a support to them. It would be a blessing. And God can work through all the things that we're involved in. Amen. Nothing's too big for the Lord. Amen. Our, our problem is, is we make our situation bigger than, than God. We, we make our, our, we look at our resources, we look at what we know, what we understand, and the Bible says that he's able to do all things with God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Praise God. We're back in the book of Revelation tonight, looking at the seven churches. We're going to be reading from Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Welcome to our visitors here tonight. God bless you. Delighted to have you here with us. Amen? Looking at the churches in Revelation, trying to understand things that God is telling us so that we can be overcomers. That's one of the key themes of the seven churches, he that overcometh, amen, shall inherit. And he's got different promises that he gives for each church. So it's important that we understand that in living for God, no matter how much Holy Ghost you got, no matter how, how high your calling or whatever your calling is, no matter how long you've been in the church, no matter how much you pray or fast, there's still some things you've got to overcome. Amen. There's still some things you've got to overcome, and so the Bible lets us understand that. Revelation 2 and 18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will set, cast her into a bed with them that commit adultery, and her into a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keep my, keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, they shall, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we're going to give a little bit of background, a little bit of detail here. And, and the background will give us some understanding to some of the things that are, are being said here. Sometimes we don't understand things in the Bible because we don't have the right context or the right setting. And so sometimes if you pull something out of a setting, you might understand the words, but you might not understand the application because you don't have the context. Just like you can pull a tree out of a picture, and you can look at the tree, you can understand it's a tree, but you don't understand where that tree came from or, or if it has any meaning. But if you put the tree back into the whole picture and you see what's around it, then you understand the meaning or how that tree fits into the whole situation. So Thyatira means castle of Thya. In Turkish, it means white castle. I don't think they had hamburgers coming from there. <laughs> Praise God. The city was located on the main Roman road between Pergamos and Sardis in the province of Lydia, near the province of Mysia. So it was right on the edge of Mysia and in, in Lydia 
And it's important to understand, again, remember that when Paul, on his one of his missionary journeys, he was seeking to go into Mycia, and the Holy Ghost wouldn't let him go there. And he wanted to go into Bithynia, and the Holy Ghost wouldn't let him go there. And just because we have a calling, and just because God has put something into our lives and we have a burden, doesn't mean we can just go wherever we want with that calling or with that burden but we've got to be directed by the Holy Ghost. So Paul was sensitive enough and the people that were with him to understand, well, there's people over here that need to be saved, let's go over. But no, the Holy Ghost says, don't do that. So then they said, well, we'll try to go over here. No, the Holy Ghost said, don't do that. And then he gets a vision to go over to Philippi, amen. The city of Thyatira did not gain prominence until one of Alexander the Great's generals, Seleucus, Nicator rebuilt it as a buffer against armies trying to attack Pergamos, and he rebuilt this around 282. So the thing with this city was a lot of Greek cities, and this was a Greek oriented city in what we call Asia Minor today, most of them had what you call an Acropolis, and that's where all the temples were. But there was, it was also a secondary purpose. It was built as a fortification, and if the city was under attack or the walls were breached, they all retreated up to the Acropolis for a last stand. This city did not have an Acropolis, so it was not easy to defend. So they built it up as a buffer city. So if armies came against Pergamos, which was a big city, they could slow down with the armies that were at Thyatira and have some time, buy some time for the soldiers that were at Pergamos. This was the idea, amen. So when Thyatira came under the influence of Rome, they continued that practice of using it as a buffer city. The city was known for its trade guilds and the dyeing of purple or red cloth. Okay, so sometimes when we see purple in the Bible, in Roman times, it was actually what we would call a shade of red. But this red was a little more brilliant than the red that you made from oyster shells and, and, or the purple you made from oyster shells. Apparently, they got it from a root of a, some kind of root called the matter root, and it allowed it to have a brilliant kind of a red color. And even today, that area is known for the red that comes out of that area for dying fezes, which are kind of caps you sometimes see in Turkey on people's heads. There seems to be, there seem to have been more trade guilds in Thyatira than any other city. And th this, this trade guild thing is, is important in understanding what Paul, or not what Paul, what Jesus is saying to the church here. So there were trade guilds for wool, wool coppersmiths, linen, leather, dyeing, pottery, slaves, bakers, other things. Whatever were the common industries of those days, they had trade guilds, and almost everybody, if you were involved in one of those occupations, you needed to be along to a trade guild. It's kind of like around here, there's certain kinds of jobs you've got to belong to a union in order to get into those places. If you don't belong to a union, sometimes you can't get a job there. And in areas where the unions are strong enough, you can't get a job legally unless you belong to a union. So these trade guilds kind of worked the same way. Paul, Paul had a convert from Thyatira. When we go to the book of Acts, we were talking about Paul wanting to go to Mycenae and Bithynia and then getting a vision to go over to Philippi. When he gets over to Philippi, he meets a lady named Lydia, from the province of Lydia, who was from Thyatira. And so it said she was a seller of purple, and so she belonged to one of these guilds from Thyatira that were, were the dyers' guilds. So it was also known as a holy city in its early history, and its chief god was Tyrimnas, a Lydian sun god, there was a temple of Tyrimnos in front of the city. So apparently as you approach the city in front of it, there's this temple there, the temple to Tyrimnos, which was the Lydian version of sun god. Tyrimnos, the pri primary Lydian god, was also identified with the Greek god Apollo, which is the Greek version of the sun god. So a lot of these gods, they have different names as they change the cultures, but they're the same, same thing. So in other words, in, in Greek culture, they might call it Apollo, and they call it, you know, in this case, Tyrimnus. They might call it Diana at Ephesus, but call it Artemis 
some other place the same idea. So sometimes these gods, they're different names, but they have the same meaning and idea. Okay, Thyatira also worshipped the goddess Sambath, a variation of Sybil, who would speak prophecy for Apollo. So now note that one of the primary places of worship, this is very important, and if you can understand this concept, it helps you understand 1 Corinthians chapter, chapters 12, 13, and 14, what Paul is getting at when he's talking about prophecy and speaking in tongues. The most well-known, most famous Greek temple in ancient times, written about by many different author, authors across hundreds of years, was the Oracle at Delphi. And the Oracle at Delphi was, was a place where they had a priestess that was there, and this priestess would give forth oracles, and they would interpret it, and people, even outside of Greece, would come to this oracle to get direction and to get instruction. And sometimes even the oracles appeared to, to be correct the way history worked out. So at Delphi, there was a priestess who would utter prophecies under the spirit of Apollo. The high priestess of Del Delphi was called the Pythia. Okay, so the Pythia is a person, a priestess that interprets these pagan prophecies. It was derived, Pythia is derived from the Greek pytho or pytho. And that's derived from the Greek word puthane, which means to rot, which referred to the sickly sweet smell of the rotting body, body of a monstrous python killed by Apollo at Delphi. Now think about it. Okay, Apollo is also called the sun god in Greek. Zeus was the father. So to the Greek mind, they think Zeus is God, Apollos is the son of God, and in their mythology, they've almost got a kind of the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. It's not the fulfillment, but they're talking about it. He kills the monstrous python. The heel of the man, the seed of the woman, will bruise the head of the serpent. So there's a connection there. So what this tells us is, see, a lot of these ancient myths are really polluted versions of what the Bible had already given us a long time ago. So that's why you find out there's a lot of similarity in a lot of these myths because they're really polluted versions. When people fell away from God, they remembered parts, but they didn't remember the real reason or the real story that was involved in there. Okay, so... The slave girl that Paul meets in Philippi, the, the, lady, the girl with the spirit of divination that follows them for three days and finally he turns around and casts it out. It's a, in the King James it says a spirit of divination. If you look up the Greek word, it's a spirit of python. See, so the spirit of python was the spirit of divination which went with the spirit of the oracle of Delphi. And so any of these pagan temples... They were already familiar in Greek culture with speaking in tongues and interpretation before the Holy Ghost ever came to them. And this is why they were acting out with those, because especially the women, because they were saying, look, I'm on the level of one of these Pythias. I'm on the level of one of these priests. And Paul had to let them understand it's not just for you, but the, with the, those gifts of the Spirit are there to edify the body. And God is supposed to be in control of those gifts of the Spirit. Amen. So the summary, the high priestess of Apollo was called the Pythia, from the Greek pytho, from the Greek puthain, which means to rot, from the myth of Apollo killing a monster of python at Delphi. So the oracle at Delphi was a temple to Apollo. He was considered a sun god. He was also considered the son of God because Zeus was his father. So in the Greek mind, Zeus is what we would call the God of the Old Testament. The God we call God the Father. That's the Greek mind there. They're thinking. So when you say the Son of God, see, and this is part of the problem sometimes when you're witnessing to people, you've got to take their culture into, into perspective. Because you can say Son of God, and they say, yeah. And you're thinking Jesus, and they're thinking Apollo. You can say one God, and in their mind they mean the one highest God. 
You mean there's only one God? In their mind, they mean Zeus or somebody up there like Jupiter. They're thinking like that. So you have to understand these things. So the Lord's address starts to the church by saying he's the son of God. Who have eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass in Revelation 2.18. He starts it out that way. Why? Because he's addressing Christians living in a city where Apollo is considered the son of God and he's considered the fire God. He's also considered a God that judges wrong and gives repentance or, or restores those that are penitent. So Jesus is letting them know, he's not it, I am. Hold on. Just because they say he's it, I am, I am. I am the son of God. If you haven't dealt with anything like that, you're getting ready to deal with it. Because it's out there floating around in the atmosphere. They call it new age, and maybe you haven't dealt with it. But the new age is... You know, there's all, we're all sons of God, whether we've been born again or not. Amen. And fire gods and all kinds of stuff. So there are spirits out there that are, that are trying to do that. So this is the only time in the book of Revelation where that term son of God is used. So Apollo, who's worshipped in Thyatira as Apollo tri, Triminus, okay? In other words, this they, they took over the old temple of Tyrimnus, and made it Apollo Tyremnus, which is what happened in a lot of these cities. When a new conqueror would come in, they'd combine the gods, merge them together in a way. And Apollo was also represented as the sun god. So Jesus also borrows from John's vision in chapter 1, saying he has eyes like unto a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. And what Jesus is trying to say is he is the true son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. He is the God of the Old Testament come down to be our kinsman redeemer, to be our savior. Amen. He's the true son of God. Amen. So he's saying, I'm the true son of God, but I've got eyes of fire. And, I, and my feet are burnished like brass. And so what he's saying is, is I see what's going on. I know what's going on. And I'm standing in judgment. I'm standing in judgment here of everything that's going on and, and I'm going to judge righteously and I'm going to judge all that you're doing but I will judge it righteously but you need to understand I'm the one that really sees what is going on. Amen. And so notice that eyes of fire, the Bible says that Jesus or God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. God is equated with fire. When Elijah prays, God answers. Fire comes down out of heaven. When God descends upon Mount Sinai, there's a fire enveloping itself on the mountain. When Ezekiel sees the vision in the plain, it's a fire folding inward on its cell. And when the pillar cloud guides the children of Israel in the night, it becomes a pillar of fire. Amen. So, so we see that fire talks about God, and it also, and the brazen altar talks about, or brass talks about judgment. Again, when God told Israel to make a tabernacle, He said, "Make a brazen altar." Well, that's where sin is judged at the the brazen altar. I can't go beyond the altar to the tabernacle till I deal with my sin first. Sometimes that's why people have a hard time in their prayer life is they've got sin they haven't dealt with. When you've got sin in your life you haven't dealt with, you can't get into the presence of God. You see, so the tabernacle is a plan. It's a plan of an approach to God. And it's, it's uh, modeled after a true tabernacle in heaven. If you look in Revelation and you look in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says that there's a true tabernacle not made by hands. And so the tabernacle on earth was a model of that, and it showed that, that there's an approach to God. It preaches what we preach. It preaches what the New Testament preaches. There's an enclosure around it. There's only one way in. You can't get in by jumping over the wall. Right? You've got to come in through the door. You've got to come in the right way. The door is always on the same side. The wall's high enough, you can't see over it. 
When you come in, the first thing you've got to approach is a brazen altar. You've got to deal with the altar. And again, in our lives, in living for God, if any person is going to successfully live for God, they've got to have a prayer life. Because before you can touch God, you've got to deal with the sin. You've got to deal with the sin in your life. If you've got sin, the Bible says in Isaiah 58, I think it is, that our sins separate us between him and them. It's not that God can't reach, but our sins will separate us. So we've got to deal with sin. That's why it's a good thing to have prayer in the beginning when you get up, to start praying when you wake up in the morning. Don't wait till the middle of the day. Because if you went to bed and deal, didn't deal with the sin, you get up, you're still not dealt, dealt with the sin. You wonder where God is. You can't find the presence of God where God wants us to find his presence. Amen? Is, is that a legitimate statement that God wants us to find his presence? Yes, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Not by the Holy Ghost or from the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, 17, in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So when I get into the presence of God, joy comes. When I get into the presence of God, righteousness and peace come. Amen. Righteousness, peace, and joy. And sometimes the reason we're all dried up and we don't have any strength is we haven't gotten into the presence of God. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. Amen. David said, in your presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's in the presence of God. He'll hide me in his presence. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. You're in the presence of God. It's in his presence you get answers. It's in his presence you get direction. It's in his presence that you get what you need from God. It's in his presence when we're renewed in our heart and our mind and we see how things really are. Amen. And the reason many fail, the reason we have many problems is because we do not get into the presence of God I mean there's many that go to church they're waiting for the ministry to usher you in but you need to learn how to get into the presence of God on your own you're waiting for the right song the right message the right the right revival service amen God wants you to find him now God's not looking for the minister to get you in he's not looking for the right revival service God is looking for you to get filled by him and get into his presence amen and they that hunger and thirst after righteousness they shall be filled are you hungry enough to get what God wants you to have hallelujah Hallelujah. So he's looking. Amen. He's looking. He's a consuming fire. He'll burn up all the dross in us. Sometimes that's why we won't go into the presence of God. We got some things we like. We know that God doesn't like. And we don't want to go because God's going to burn them up if we go. So we, so we put off going to see God. Amen. Not realizing if God wants to burn it up, he's got something better. If God wants to take that away, he's got a better thing for me. Amen. He didn't come to make my life miserable. He said, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. Amen. He said, I'm the good shepherd. He said, I'll cause you to lay down in the green pasture. I'll restore your soul. I'll lead you beside the still waters. Amen. I'll prepare a table before you. But you've got to make your mind up. I'm coming into God's presence. God, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting amen you got to open yourself up to God he's not going to hurt you he, he's only going to operate if he needs to hallelujah he's a judging fire amen he's a he's a fire a consuming fire in heaven like brass again the brazen altar the serpent in the wilderness it was a judgment on sin brazen serpent on a post they murmured against God. If a certain serpent bit them, if they looked upon that, it was an acknowledgment that they had sinned and God healed their sin. Deuteronomy 28, when it's talking about the blessings and the curses that are going on there, God says, if you do this, I'll bless you. I'll do this, I'll bless you. I'll bless you, I'll bless you. But if you don't do this, that this curse is going to come. If you don't do this, it's going to curse. It's going to come. And eventually, the heavens... 
The earth is going to be iron and the heaven is going to be like brass. What does that mean? It means God's not hearing your prayers. Brass is the type of judgment. So when he's standing there with brass, brazen feet or feet burnished in the, in the fire so that they're shining, he's standing there in judgment and his eyes are seeing things as they really are. There are many people that want to go, that go to church, but they really don't want to be in the presence of God. They're afraid. They'll leave. They'll come one time and God, God will come in and they'll get scared and they won't come back. So, some because they feel condemned. They think the church is condemning them when it's, it's God's spirit is making, making apparent who they are. And they feel naked, just like Adam and Eve felt naked after they ate of the tree. Yeah. Amen. And so, so sometimes others, they realize God's really here. But that means I'm going to have to change it, and I don't want to change. Or I'm, I was gonna, if I know about God, I'm going to have to be responsible for the things of God, and I don't want to be responsible. People running from their call, running for their purpose that God's got for them in life, go from church to church because they don't want to yield to the purpose. Amen. And they're running from the purpose and so they'll come in and go out and they don't come back again because they know that if they're going to face God, they've got to acknowledge their purpose. And just like Jonah, a lot of times they end up in, in the belly of a situation. Amen. So the eyes of fire, feet of brass also calls to mind Daniel's vision. In Daniel chapter 10, when he prayed and he saw a man all in white, girded with a golden girdle, his voice like the sound of a multitude of many waters, his body burnished like brass and his feet like brass, his eyes like fire, his face like lightning. It calls to mind that. And again, Daniel couldn't stand in that presence. Daniel was a righteous person in our eyes and in God's eyes. But yet even Daniel in his righteousness couldn't stand. Again, this, this, that passage there, if you go have time to go back and read it, explains to you how people often react when they come into the presence of God for the first time. So Daniel says, I saw the vision, but the other men with me ran away quaking in fear. What does that mean? They didn't see anything, but they sensed the presence of God. And when they sensed it, it made them so afraid that they ran away. And that's how many people react the first time that they come into the presence of God. So Jesus refines us. Notice what the book of Malachi says. The true son of God will refine you. See, Apollo can't refine you. Apollo might be able to give you a good word, might come true, but Apollo can't save your soul. Apollo can't refine you. So Malachi 3, 1 and 2, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of the Levites and purge them as gold and silver. That the Lord may offer, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. See, so God will come and he purifies us. Why does he do that? Because he wants us to become what he intended us to be. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be with him in eternity. He wants us to be able to come into his presence and have fellowship. So God does not refine us so that he can say, look, I'm better than you. Look, I got that on you. Look, I, I'm the holy one. God's not doing it for ego purposes. So get that out of the picture. We might do things for ego purposes. God doesn't. God doesn't do it. He doesn't chasten us for ego. He doesn't save us for ego. Yeah, we are glory to him, but he'd be glory by himself without us. 
He does not need us to be what he is. That's, that's why he's God. He is the I am. He does not need us to be what he is. He doesn't need us to love him to be love. He is love. Praise God. Amen. You need to understand, again, Zechariah 13 and 9. Zechariah 13 and 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and they shall call on my name and I will hear them and will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. You see, God is a refiner by fire, so he stands to judge. Sometimes not everybody makes it through. Here he's talking about Israel and he says, in this time that I do that, I'll bring a third through. I'll bring a third through. Matthew 3 and 11, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoe I am not worthy to unlatch. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he shall thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner, but burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So now notice the fire is applied to believers, the Holy Ghost and fire, and the fire is applied to unbelievers, burn up the chaff. See, God does a lot of things that, depending on where you're standing, it can work for you or against you. Right? The flood works for Noah, but it works against people that aren't in the ark. The plagues work for Israel, but they work against Egypt. See, sometimes we get the bad end of a, the deal because we're not standing where we ought to be standing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, so God can make the same thing work two ways. Works in judgment for those that aren't right, but anoints those that are right. Now, I don't know about you, but I want Holy Ghost and fire. I mean, I want some, fire speaks of zeal. I want some zeal for God. Amen. I want some zeal to pray, to, to worship, Amen. to live for him, to seek him, to be a witness. I want some zeal for God in my life. Amen. I don't want to just feel the Holy Ghost, but I want Holy Ghost and fire. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and that's the real type of the church. And that's another reason why there's tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. It's Holy Ghost and fire. He's lighting the candlestick. He's lighting that candlestick for the night season. The night season started when he went up to heaven, amen, before the church started. Then he lit the candlestick of the church after he poured in the oil of the Holy Ghost into it. And that light of the church, that light of the truth is the light in the world. He said, as long as I am in the world, there is light. He's not physically here, but he's here in the church. The church is the candlestick. The candlestick needs to stand up with the light of God. Amen. But the candlestick needs to be formed by the Spirit of God. It's gold that's hammered into place. Amen. That gold is hammered till it's formed into the way that it can hold the oil that God's got for it so that when he lights the oil, the oil doesn't run out on the ground, but the oil can burn in the midnight hour. Amen and give light to those that are looking for God. Is somebody looking for God here tonight? Let's praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. So the church was commended for its works. He said, you got works of charity. I know your works. And charity and service and faith and patience and your works and the, and the latter to be more than the former. Amen. And we're not saved by works, but yet if we've got the Holy Ghost, there should be some works. Amen. If we've got the Holy Ghost, there should be some works or fruit of the Spirit, if you will. Amen. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That ought to be coming out of us at least sometime, right? Amen. And so we're not saved by works, but if I'm really saved, 
there ought to be something in me manifesting that I am saved. There ought to be something that the world may not understand it or recognize it. They may make fun of it. They may reject it. But there ought to be something that's coming because of God's spirit in me. Amen. And so James 2.14, we, we know the passage. We're not going to look at it. But he said, as the body is dead without the spirit, so is faith without works. Okay, and, and that works are not limited to witness and to people, but it's really our life. It's not just an outreach Sunday or outreach day or consecration month, but it ought to be a daily thing. Amen? Each day we ought to be living for God. 24-7. Praise God. Vacation we should be living for God. Hallelujah. Work living for God. Home living for God. Striving to live for God. Amen. This is so James is saying, without faith, there's no works. And so if you really got faith in God, you got saved, it, something's going to come out of your life. Something's going to come out of you. So true faith will motivate the Christian to have charity. Right? He said, I know your works. You got charity. True faith will motivate the Christian to have charity. Charity suffers long and is kind. Amen. So true faith will cause those, that if you're in the church, to help others. Right? Because the Bible says that God created us with a purpose from the foundation of the world. And true faith, we're going to have, if I've, got, if I've got true faith or I've got the Holy Ghost in me, I'm going to have faith and patience as works. Right? Because the Bible, the Bible says, be not slothful. Hebrews 6 and 12, be not slothful, but be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Sometimes we think just because I got the Holy Ghost, got baptized in Jesus' name, I have automatically got all the promises in my hand. But be not slothful. In other words, I got to be diligent. I have to put some effort in to obtain the promise. The promise is given, but I've got a race I've got to run. I've got a race I've got to run. I've got to keep my eye on the mark. I can't just go about blindly. Paul says, I'm not fighting blindly. I'm not hitting at the air. But I've got a mark I'm trying to hit. I'm focused on something that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. If by any means, I might attain unto the resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So be not slothful, but be followers of them who through faith and patience. What's he talking about? He's talking about Abraham, Isaac, Enoch, Cain, not Cain, but Abel. He's talking about all these men, of, men and women of faith, Sarah, Hannah, Esther, all these people. He's talking about these people. They were patient. They didn't quit because it didn't show up this year. But they believed the promise. Or as it says in Hebrews 11, 13, these all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Any pilgrims here tonight? Any pilgrims here tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So the Lord, then he rebukes them. He commends them for a lot of things, but he rebukes them for the teaching. Not because Jezebel's a teacher, but for what she is teaching. She is rebuked. There's nothing there that says that there's a problem that she's a teacher, but it's what she is Teaching, verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, or thou allows that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my ser servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them 
that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Amen. So he's rebuking her, and he's rebuking the church because they're allowing her to have this false teaching. Now, most likely, if you just take the passage at face value, it's talking about a single individual, a woman. Is her name really Jezebel? Probably not. That name is being used because what she is typifying. But it could be Jezebel. But it's a single individual person that is teaching things that are causing the saints in the church to be seduced and act immorally, get involved in sexual immorality. The reason probably Jezebel is being used is because we know the type in the Old Testament where Jezebel, she's a person that does things by intimidation, by usurping power, by seduction. This is how she does the things that she's doing. Okay, and she usurps power because she's the queen. She takes and writes letters in Ahab's name to have Nadab killed, you know, because of his vineyard. Okay, and so she's usurping power. She didn't have authority to do that. And so this Jezebel is, is doing that. And as mentioned before, Thyatira was known for their trade guilds. Well, each guild had a patron god. And the overall god was this Apollo Tyremnos, the sun god. It was the overall god. And the guilds would have fellowship meetings. And when they had the fellowship meetings, they would offer up unto their gods that they were sacrificing to. And often they would follow with orgies. So you can imagine the pressure that some of these Christian people were having. If you're not part of the guild, you can't work. So he's probably telling them, it's okay, you can go to those. After all, God understands. But when they go to that, they become involved in idolatry, offering unto gods that are de demonically inspired, and sexual orgies. So when he says she, she's teaching them to commit fornication, that's sexual immorality. It means in two senses, in the sense that they're worshiping gods that are not the true God, and they're physically getting involved in sexual immorality. Again, this is very likely, this is how Balaam was able to get Balak the king of Moab, to bring a judgment on Israel. He could not pronounce a curse on them because God had blessed them. When you're living right for God, the devil can't do anything to you unless God allows it. So the next step that the devil tries is to get you to do something wrong so God will judge you. Try to seduce you out. So Balaam told the king of Moab, he said, have the, the Moab women invite the Israelite men to their festivals. And they did, and they got involved in idolatry, and they got involved in sexual immorality, and God brought a, and brought a plague. They brought a curse on themselves. This is why it's important to live holy. This is why it's important to stay in the boundaries that God gives. Staying inside the boundary God, God gives helps prevent the devil from bringing judgment or the devil from tempting us to do things. If, I'm stay, if I know the boundaries and I'm going to stay inside, the devil can't get me outside that. Now, if I don't have a boundary, if I don't have a defined line, I don't know when the devil has got me outside. I don't know when my own flesh has got me outside. See, so there are many people, again, today that call themselves Christians. They're outside the bounds of what God accepts because they have not drawn boundaries in their life. Amen? Am I making sense? It's important to understand. That's why there's holiness. A lot of people, holiness is an ugly word. They got these visions of things and Maybe where they went, there was bad things that happened, but it's still from God. It's still a God thing. Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's a God thing. 
Follow peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In other words, you're not going to heaven unless you live holy. I don't care how many people you raised from the dead. I don't care how many crusades you've preached. I don't care how many miracles and how many visions you've had. If you don't live holy, follow peace and holiness with all men, with God, without which no man shall see the Lord. No man. It's all of us. Praise God. Now, who was Jezebel? Well, there's some speculation that Jezebel was the pastor's wife there because she would have a place of influence and access to teaching. But again, this is only a speculation. There's no real weight to that. Some think that Lydia from Philippi was the woman, Jezebel, because she came from Thyatira. But that, to me, is highly unlikely because that doesn't seem to fit the personality or character of her that is represented in Acts chapter 16. Here you find a woman that is looking for God, believes in God in Acts chapter 16. You find a woman that God opens her heart to what Paul is preaching, and she opens her house to be a place for the people of God. So that's highly unlikely. But the point is, is whoever the person was, she was teaching things that were causing God's people to get involved in sin, idolatry and sexual immorality. Amen. Sexual immorality is one of the things that has always been a problem. Idolatry and sexual immorality has always been a problem for God's people throughout the Bible. Throughout the whole Bible. Always a problem. But right, at, right after God gives the Ten Commandments and Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai, and when Moses doesn't show up, after a little bit of time, they fall right into idolatry. Reason, reason we fall into that is, is we want to see something. Where is our God? They weren't necessarily saying that that idol represented a different God. They weren't necessarily saying that. But they were making God to be something he wasn't. They were trying to represent See, no idol can represent God because he's infinite. He's the multitude of all things. And the best an idol can do is, is, is represent an aspect, a small aspect of God. And it's not him. And then when they had the idols, they said they rose up to play. They rose up to dance and sat down to play. And when Moses came down, the people were naked. They got involved in some orgies right there. See, idolatry will lead you into sexual immorality. Again, we talked about Balaam and even Solomon and Jeroboam. They brought idolatry into Israel. Jezebel brought immoral Baal worship, which also involves sexual immorality into there. And so we got to be vigilant. We got to be, we've got to be vigilant to keep idols out of our lives. And, and, and part of the problem is, is we think, well, I don't have a statue to that. Or I don't have a picture of that. But see, an idol is something you bow to in place of God. And if I'm bowing to something and giving worship that I should be giving to God, that becomes an idol. If what I want becomes more important than what God wants. Even though I might be living a moral life, my want becomes an idol. You understand what I'm saying? This is true. Okay, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, it's the truth. Okay, if, if my goal for my, my life becomes bigger than what God wants me to do, that becomes an idol. If what you think of me becomes more important than what God thinks of me, that becomes an idol. If what others think of me or you becomes more important than what God wants us to do, that becomes an idol. 
So Jesus said, he said in verse 23, he said, I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So now the word reins really in the Old Testament and New Testament means kidney, literally. In the literal sense, it means a kidney. But in the Jewish mind, the kidneys represented the innermost being, thoughts, motives, and feelings. So when, when the Lord is saying, I search the reins and the hearts, he's saying, I search not only how you feel, but your motive, your reasoning, your purposes. I see all the things. Remember, he's got eyes of fire. He sees it all. He can burn through our, he can see through our arguments. He can see through our excuses. He can see the truth. A lot of times we try to give God, God, Excuses for what we're supposed to do. God wants us to do something. Look over in Jeremiah 17. God told Jeremiah in the Old Testament a similar thing. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing so so God searches our hearts and really when Jesus says I'm the one that is trying the reins and searching the hearts he's really saying he's the God of the Old Testament because he's saying to the church of Thyatira the same thing that God in the Old Testament said to Jeremiah so God searches our motives sometimes things happen in our lives because God wants to bring our motive to the surface Sometimes we think we're committed, just like Peter thought he was committed. Peter didn't think he was going to deny the Lord three times. He thought he was committed. But he had not yet faced the experience he was about to face. And so sometimes God lets things happen in our lives to reveal our motives to ourselves so that we can seek God. And get right with God. But what, sometimes things happen and we blame, well, I wouldn't have done that if they hadn't done this. Or if, if the circumstance hadn't been like this, then I wouldn't have acted this way. God, God doesn't care. He's not judging their circumstance or them. He's talking to you. He's judging your motive. Did you do the right thing? Did I do the right thing? Being a Christian is not me doing the right thing because you do the right thing. It's me doing the right thing, even if nobody else is, because I'm following him. Let's praise God a little bit. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. We worship you. We need you, Lord God. We need you to help us to strengthen us here, Lord God. You are worthy, Lord. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Hallelujah. Open our hearts and minds. Give us faith. Give us courage, Lord God. Give us faith to know and to believe, Lord God, that you've got our best interests at heart, that you love us with an everlasting love. So Peter didn't know he was going to be a denier. I honestly think Peter said, no, I'm never going to deny. I think he really believed that at the time, just like us. No, I'll never stand up. But again, we don't know the circumstances. Sometimes God steps back to show us something in our heart that we didn't know was there. Now we just need to be like Peter is cry and repent, get back to God. And sometimes, again, we don't know about our heart because we won't pray. That's why Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the soul is willing, the spirit is willing, but the, the flesh is weak. Our humanity is weak. Praying will strengthen us. Praying will strengthen us for the situation. Praying will allow God to speak to us so we can deal with it in his presence rather than in a circumstance in life. You know, when you face a battle, if you've already fought that battle, 
you know you can win it again. If you won it, won it in your prayer closet, you know you can win it on the street. But if you don't have a prayer life, and you don't let God search your heart, there are things that finally God will let them come. Amen. Not because he's trying to embarrass us, but because he's trying to save us. So one, one commentator, back to the guilds, one commentator said the guilds operated like a lot like a Masonic Lodge does today. So Masonic Lodge, I don't know if you know much about them. No Christian, no person that really calls himself a Christian could be part of a secret organization like the Masonic Lodge where you have to take an oath to that organization. And taking that oath, if you're going to keep the oath you take to them, you will have to go against what the Bible says and what God wants you to do at some point. Because the Masonic Lodge will make the brotherhood of the Lodge more important than God. Maybe you don't believe that, so I'll give you a, a true story. When I was working at Foxborough probably 20 years ago, when I'd go out at lunch and walk, and there was a guy I knew that named Peter Matthew that was involved in a church over here, over in Abington. He, he was a very faithful person, read his Bible, was, lived a very Christian life. He was one of the elders in the church. One day I saw him walking around. He had like a cloud on his head, you know, like you can get this cloud when he walked. So I just felt like I should go up and walk with him, just walk with him and start talking. What's going on? He said, well, we found out that within our congregation there was a lot of Masons. And he said, when the pastor found out about that, he went to each one of them individually he said, you either have to quit the lodge or you have to quit the church. There was about 25 of us there, I remember. Every one of them quit the church. And he said, I wondered why we couldn't get revivals or any excitement going in the church. Whenever we try to do something for outreach, there was always people that would damp it down. They turned about to be these Masonic guys because they serve a different God. Okay, and if you read their documents, they will tell you that the first three degrees are intended to deceive the initiators, the initiates. Read Albert Pike's Moral, Morals and Dogma, which is considered to be the Bible for the Scottish Rite. 32 degrees, 33 degrees. And in that, it says the lower three degrees are intentionally deceived into thinking that the lodge is something else than what it really is. And when you start to get to the fourth degree, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. So this is probably what he's talking about, the depths of Satan. Because remember, these guilds were similar, functioning like the Masonic Lodge. And initially, when you get into them, it's just worshiping the gods, just worshiping the gods and getting involved in orgies, but... Little by little, you get sucked deeper and deeper into things that are not of God. That's how the Masonic Lodge works. Each degree, they open up a little bit more occultic information and subtle things with signs that go on. They do that. And so these lodges probably work the same way, and that's why he's talking about the depths of Satan. So idolatry and sexual immorality are always the initial step in somebody's falling away from God. So I think that's probably why Paul said, and we're, we're running out of time, but notice that Paul said in a couple places, he said, flee fornication. Run from it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, flee idolatry. Don't, don't try to stand and fight sexual immorality. Run from it. Run from idolatry. Why? Paul probably understood that these are the initial things that work in a person's life to bring them into bondage. Amen. So finally, he closes 
with the exhortation and the promise. He says, hold on to what you got. That's a good message for all of us here tonight. Hold on to what you got. Even if you're not satisfied with what you got, even if you feel like you don't have all the things from God you want, hold on to what you do have that you know is true. And start to add. Start to add to what you've got. Don't be discouraged by what you don't have. Look at what you do have. Recognize you need to add more, but don't, don't let go. Don't, let, don't throw the towel in because you don't have the whole basket. But take what you've got. Look how far you've come. Look what God has done. Don't throw it away, but hold on to what you got. Amen. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to hold on. Amen. And so he says, overcomers will be given power to rule over the nations. He's talking about in the millennial kingdom. In one of the other churches, he said, he that overcomes, will, I'll grant with him to sit on my throne and rule with me. So those that are overcomers in the millennial reign, they'll rule on this world with the Lord. So a lot of things that God does in our lives, he's training us for the life to come. We will be given the great morning star. Well, the morning star precedes daylight. So it's, what it's trying to say is Jesus is coming. He's going to precede the rapture. He's the morning star. He's the son of righteousness with healing in his morning. You overcome, the Lord's going to be there. He'll be the morning star for you. There'll be darkness. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. Let's stand here tonight. Hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Lord, we thank you here tonight. We praise you, Lord God. We magnify you. We exalt you, Lord God. Lord, we lift our hearts to you, Lord God. We lift our hands to you. You are able, Lord God. We ask you, Lord, to do a work in our hearts and minds. Lord God, if there's things that we need to get out of our lives or to straighten out, give us strength and faith to believe it. Lord, help us to hold on to what we've already received from you, Lord God, knowing that you have good thoughts towards us, that your purpose towards us is not bad or evil, but you desire to give good things, Lord God, that we might be fruitful. We ask you, Lord, on every heart and mind as we leave this place, Lord, that we listen to what your spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.